In this video, I'll show you how the processing of migrants works here at the border. We'll also talk to a lawyer so we can understand the legality behind the scenes. So yeah, the first step is not testing. The first step is just getting in a, in a holding facility, right? right. Yes. Yeah. And this, Turkey. this is the COVID testing you're talking about. What's happening now is also not helping. It's just for show. She doesn't know where she's going. She doesn't know with who. She doesn't know nothing. And okay. they fear if they're going to go back to their country, they're going to get killed. I used to actually stay here at the Catholic Charities. Like you said, if you don't see it directly, you'll never know that it's happening. What percentage get denied? Okay, and who's giving the church the money to do it? They can either take a decision to go to that court hearing or disappear into society. You know, we see the pictures of the kids sleeping under tinfoil blankets. They're going to find American seeds and marry and everything's good. And that's not true. If they cannot prove their case, as a refugee, they're gonna be deported, and that's it. Good afternoon, guys. Here in McAllen, Texas, we have Raul and we have Brian, and they're gonna bring us into the details on how migrants, how they navigate the United States. Once they get over that wall, once they get on US soil, what exactly happens? Raul lives here in McAllen, knows it's almost the, the the migrant path, right? They go point A to point B to point C, point D, and out. While they're being processed until they get shipped out wherever they're gonna get shipped out to. So what's okay? So what's the first step? You know, they get um basically they, they get over the border. Basically, they cross the river. Okay. Come over the border wall or around the border wall, just depending. Okay. And then once they get apprehended, which they want to get apprehended because they know they're gonna be released, they get apprehended by border patrol. They get brought into the holding facility over here in Donna, Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, from that Donna, that Donna facility, they get processed and whatever they're gonna do. That's a that's a massive facility, right? It's a huge facility. Right now, it's there's close to five thousand people in that facility. Okay. So once they get processed in that facility, they're brought to McAllen to what I call is Tent City. Okay. That's where they do the COVID testing and stuff. After the COVID testing. If they're negative, they go a little bit farther down, a few blocks over to the to the. And this this is Catholic the Church. this is the COVID testing you're talking about. Yes. Right. So just to be straight, they come over, they they put their hands up or whatever, and and uh, border border patrol says, okay, you're coming with us. Yes. They go in a bus. They go to the big facility for how many days? The Donna it, facility. The Donna, it's about three day process. Okay. But and depending, right now they're a little bit backtracked due to the amount of people they have in there. So, okay. but normally it's like a three-day process. Okay, and then they don't know if they have COVID then or not, right? No. They get tested after that three-day process. After they're done from there, they ship them over here where they get tested over here. And this is over here. This is in uh, McAllen, Texas. The next step. Okay. Yeah. And so they come into this facility, get tested. Now if they're if they're positive, what happens? If they're, they're positive, they get shipped to San Juan or to uh, some, some of the hotels that are being paid for by the government. Okay. So they're, they're, they're funding hotels for them. That way they can go ahead and uh, stay there in quarantine in a hotel room okay. with no supervision or anything. So nothing's to stop them from leaving that hotel. Okay, so in the hotel, how many days? As far as I know, they're renting it for seven days for them. Seven days. Yes. And then after the seven days, what happens exactly? They find out where their families are at or whatever they're going to okay. do. They'll get them bus tickets. They'll give them a packet with the information from the government saying, you know, they're allowed to roam freely throughout the United States. Some uh -huh. are giving a court date, some are not. Okay. The reason why I say some are not, they're holding back that process to, to speed up stuff. Okay. What if they come in here and are negative? If they're negative, they're, like, they're going to come down south about two blocks over. Okay. The, we're going to go there, right? Yes. Okay. We're on our way that way right now. On the left side of Catholic Charity, there's a, uh, I mean, on the so, left side of the bus so, station. Sorry, if they're negative, they go directly to the Catholic Charity. Yes. Everyone. Yes. Okay. I gotta say, this is, this is very hard content to make because it's such a, it's such a polarizing, complex, difficult issue. I remember when I was in my younger 20s, I was living in Durango, Colorado, and there was this family in the in the entryway of a grocery store and they obviously didn't know what they're doing or where they were going and uh i put them up in a hotel for a week i didn't know their their story or anything other than i was a human and i wanted to help um so i see the humanitarian side of it and then i see the we're a system of laws and people have tried to immigrate for many years 
legally into the country and why should someone um, be able to just come in if you open the borders completely you'd have millions and millions and millions of people from all over the world coming because that's just how the world works it's uh, people go where the opportunities are it's always worked that way it always will work that way uh, yeah I'm not giving you a clear answer and I'm and I don't want to to be honest uh, it would be easier just to give you a it's black and white and that's not fair and it's not honest of course I have my bias from my experiences in life living overseas and traveling a lot of the world uh, the thing I come back to and I love about the US is how things work and how there's law most are coming I don't know all their stories I want to talk to a migrant it's really freaking hard I don't think it's gonna happen but most of the stories are you know people running from bad situations obviously and I'm sure there's there are all sorts of stories like cartels human trafficking these things are all happening at once so I could show a story of a, a, a kid that's in down and out and that's a true story and I can show the cartel member who's benefiting off the border patrol not being able to really do much these days um, having their hands tied being overwhelmed and that's a true story too so, so yeah the first step is not testing the first step is just getting in a in a holding facility right right yes. yeah these <laughs> tests these tests basically right. tell if they had it About. before when they came yes. over right right but they go into a facility crowded together with a bunch of people for three days mm. and they come out and get tested like so the, the, the test will catch if they were already positive okay but then the people that test negative could be could be holding the virus mm -hmm. it just hasn't hasn't shown up yet See, and then they let them go and then they can test positive later but they're never going to be tested again okay how long has this been going on for raul like this setup as we see here this tent city right here just started after the mcallen bus station it came out that they transported 150 people that were covid positive uh, so right after that they made a big deal about the bus station okay so they made it mandatory that they get slips saying you know what they are covid negative before they're allowed into their buses so this is the charity yes and that's one of the white vans waiting to transport people from here to the from here to the airport okay so if they're covid negative into the charity and then in a van out to the airport or to the bus station well, bus station's right here okay so or, that, those will be going to the airport okay and then where do they where are they going wherever their destination is whether it's california new york Chicago they get to choose they get to choose because basically they're saying you know what I have family in New York okay. and they look up their family and they give them a call and whatever right. and and coordinate whatever they're gonna coordinate they provide ice like the name and address of somebody in the US and they buy them either a bus ticket or a plane ticket most of them from McAllen are going directly to DFW and that's where they're spreading out from there okay so they can choose wherever they want to go. What if someone doesn't have a connection? Let's go across the street, guys. Well, that's what I heard uh, to about three days ago, and that's what we need to check into. There's this one girl who said, you know what? The Catholic Church found my family in California. Uh-huh. But the, when, when my people asked her, do you have people in California? She's like, I don't know. Okay. And so she said, well, how do you know that you're going to actually go to your family? And she's like, they talked to them. They, they arranged it. They gave him my ticket. I'm uh, going to California. She doesn't know where she's going. She doesn't know with who. She doesn't know nothing. All she knows is the Catholic charity found their family. Okay. And they're on their way that way. But yet she never spoke to their family at all. So who knows where she's actually going. I used to actually stay here at the Catholic Charities. And one day when it was really cold out, they decided to say, fuck y'all, because y'all like to smoke and y'all like to drink. And we don't like that. But yet they have an employee that's sitting there bitching that we need to make America Mexican again and he's sitting there smoking pot. Alright. So, so you you were in you were in this you were staying in this charity mm -hmm. and they said you had to leave. Yep. But like, you were you were smoking and doing shit, right? Yeah, but I wasn't smoking in there. Okay. I was following all the rules. They told me if I come in and I look high I can't stay. How about how many people did they kick out besides you? In total, I'd say they kicked out roughly 60 to 70 homeless people. And they're all American citizens, as far as all you know? Of, as far as I know, they're all American citizens. There's even an older gentleman who's missing a leg who's in a wheelchair. 
And they kicked him out for treats. And, and did they give you a reason why they kicked you all out? They said it was because of our drug habits. I'm like, so what? We have drug habits. <laughs> you don't know what's going on in our lives that makes us choose drugs. Just let it stay here. Do you want to get? Do you want to get off drugs? Yeah. You do. If someone who came through and was like, "We're gonna help you get off drugs," would you be down, or you'd be like, "Screw that, really?" I'd what, be down. What do you want? What, what's right your go-to? Right now, go -to? I'm stuck on spice. What's that? I don't even know what that is. Fake marijuana. Ah. Yeah. No, but it's worse than. It's worse Way than weed. Worse. Fake marijuana. Yes. What do you mean? It's just marijuana. It's authentic, it's authentic weed. So what happens? Oh. All the chemicals in there get you hooked on it like that. Oh, yep. it's. Uh, what happens, all the little smoke shops, they used to sell that stuff. I don't yeah. know if they still do, but yeah. they used yes, to sell that do. stuff. They do? Yep. They used to sell that stuff. The thing is, like I said, it's more, it's with all the different chemicals in there, I said, they, sometimes they put, they'll kill you right off the bat or it's highly addictive. Yep. They can put fentanyl, opiates, heroin, whatever they want on it. They even spray Raid on it. Raid, like the uh, bug Roach, repellent, yeah. like road spray. Rat, they put rat poison, what? They'll Jeez. do anything in it. I've eaten. It's more profitable that way, huh? Yeah. Cheaper chemicals. Cheaper chemicals, all right. I was going to say it's more profitable to just stick the camera out there, <laughs> sneak an interview. Me? I'll never know. Or you go in there. You should do it. Make a video. If I could get into that, man, I would sit there and I'd make them actually question their religion. Oh, no. Their, their, religion's, their religion right there is how much you're going to pay and they'll change their damn. They change their ways. Yeah, Take care, man. <laughs> All right, good luck. Get off that stuff. He was talking yeah, about. Seriously. He was talking about the door being. Get off that stuff. That stuff's gonna kill you. All right. How how are the people in the community feeling? Because an interesting fact about being here in McAllen for the last few days is, if you don't talk to a guy like you, I would have no idea anything's going on. The if streets you... the streets are normal. It's not like you see this chaos or anything on the streets. You don't, it, it, the city looks normal. It's Basically normal everything functions as normal. Okay. Like you said, if you don't see it, see it directly, you'll never know that it's happening. And that's, okay. that's why we need to get people to know that, you know what, there is a problem. Like I said, it doesn't only affect McAllen, uh, the county okay. of Hidalgo or the state of Texas. Right. It affects everybody in general because okay. these people get sent all over the United States. Okay. And somehow or another, taxpayers are paying for that, whether it's their, their tickets, their shelter, like the, the hotels that they're putting up for. And once they get here, then the church is covering them, their, their initial expenses at least, right? Exactly. Okay, and who's giving the church the money to do it? The government is. Ah. I'm sorry to say it, but the church sold themselves. <laughs> and it's not the first time, but they've sold themselves because it's a money maker. All right, guys, so I'm here with my good buddy and former immigration lawyer friend, Rafael Mariano. And Rafael's brought me through some of the basics here, which I had no clue about. Um, I think most people don't have any clue about, unless they've been in, you know, what you've done, understand the process. So, Rafa, walk us through like the legal process. If someone comes over through a port of entry mm -hmm. and they're, you know, they, they get into the United States legally like you did. Um, mm -hmm. There's a very clear legal process that they take, right? Correct. But if and somebody goes through a non-port of entry, like crosses the river, gets apprehended correct. by Border Patrol, a lot of them are not getting sent back. It's uh -huh. hard to know the exact number. Mm -hmm. um, but I saw with my own eyes, and if you look at the Customs and Border Protection, the numbers are way up. Correct. What's that? So the, they're seeking asylum. Correct. And that means they're not legal in the United States or they're illegal until their court hearing or, or walk us through how that works. So this is another complicated process, right? This is the <laughs> asylum process, right? So what that means is if you're seeking asylum, yep. you can try to cross and you say, you, you basically, you intentionally, you're caught, right? Say, hey, look, I'm here. I'm seeking asylum, right? Okay. okay. To do that, you're going to have to prove that you are a refugee, that your situation fits on the refugee status and requirements. Of okay. course, the officer there, you're not going to need to prove to him, right? You can't. That's, right. not, that's not the due process, right? right. You're going to say, look, I'm here to seek asylum, right? So take me and, and usually 
you know, I believe what's happening now, supposedly, I, I don't know. So what used to happen is you get caught, uh -huh. your process, right? Yeah. And you are saying your way, right? And the other two, why that happened? Because you cannot seek asylum while you are still in your country. Okay. That's not how the process works. You, you, you only can seek asylum. Of course, there are exceptions and I, I'm not. We don't have a year here for me to go through everything, right? Yeah, yeah. Give so, us the, the give us the quick yeah. um the quick play by play points. Let's say because like in yeah. all the research I've done, the further you get down this rabbit hole, it's just rabbit hole after oh. rabbit hole, and you can go in and like it's a full lifetime of work. yeah, it's huge. So <laughs> you're here, present yourself. Yeah, I'm a refugee. I'm seeking asylum. Your process and whatever you're seeing your way inside of the U.S. You have a court date. Right. OK, so you're not legal at all. You are a, a silent seeker. Right. You're but, but until your court date, you have papers saying you're legal to be in the United States. You're yes, I believe they give right? you. Yes, because you're going to have your process. You're going to have a, a paperwork explaining your situation with your okay. court date. Right. Okay. The court date, it is not a legalization day. Right. It's really okay. is a court day for you to be there and prove that you are in fact a refugee. Okay. And it's a really high burden, right? You have to prove because you are alleging that you are a refugee seeking, seeking asylum, right? So you stand How in front of the judge at the court, you have to have yeah. evidence obviously. And then what, yeah. what, what percentage of these people seeking asylum, you know, what percentage get denied? Yeah, so can I just really quick tell you what yeah. you need to prove? Because that's important because it's hard, yeah. right? So you need to prove that you're a refugee. So to do that, you have to fulfill some requirements. Okay. What, what are the requirements? You have to prove that you're being um, uh, persecuted in your mm -hmm. country. Okay. Okay. And you are being persecuted because specifically those factors, because okay. of race, because of religion, mm -hmm. because your nationality, because your political opinion, Okay. Or because you belong to this specific social group suffering discrimination or persecution in your own country. And it's hard, okay. right? You need to have witnesses, documents showing that. Okay. So because of that, this is an average, right? I'm just telling you like a total number, a total percentage of asylum applications that are denied. Okay. Varies between 65 to 70 percent. Um. So... So it's, wow. it's high, right? So basically, uh, like we, we think 10 applicants, approximately only three are approved, can prove so their case. The, the, the migrants that come over that spend all the money to the cartels and the coyotes Correct. and the smugglers and all that, mm -hmm. they get over, they yes. spend all their money, and then there's no guarantee once they, they sort of have a little window getting into the US where they're like, okay, we can breathe and relax, now we're legal here. Legal Correct. until the court hearing. Protected, yes. But then by going to the hearing, the the like the prob the, the probability that you're gonna get sent back home is high. Super high. Super high. <laughs> All right. So so how how long and, and this is a really difficult part about this. I want to explain to the audience here, guys. You know, the more I research in this, this is rabbit hole after rabbit hole. There's one website, everything is politicized with this topic. Right. There's no way around that, except this one site I found track immigration. Who knows? But from what I saw, they say they're independent and nonpartisan. But that's the website I also want to aim people towards. Like we're touching the basics here and we have to keep it short for a YouTube video, but it's, if you Correct. really want to get in, I find like the metrics really break down. So the people that say 99% of uh, migrants go back to their court hearing. Uh, well, when you start breaking apart those numbers, you realize, well, these are case studies, specific areas. We're not talking as like a national whole. And then, yeah. the, and then the people that say 99% avoid their asylum hearings, I don't think those are correct numbers either. So it's mm -hmm. really hard in itself just to get the right numbers because the immigration court records are secret also. This is what I read. Um, so the government statistics are difficult to verify in this. But mm -hmm. just from a common sense level, I would think, all right, I made all that effort, I spent all that money. And if I go to court and the, the probabilities I'm gonna get sent home, probably wouldn't want to go. 
-hmm. but I don't want to aim that argument. What do you what do you think on that? Like so, from your so, so, you've seen. So for my look, I saw a lot of people who are seeking asylums, right? And and that's the difference, right? The immigrants that are really here as a refugees, uh -huh. they will attend the court because they have a valid case. And, and okay. they fear if they're going to go back to their country, they're going to get killed or okay. sent to jail forever, right? Or will disappear. So I, I do not know the numbers. Like you said, it's very hard to find the real statistic. How many of those people that enter here then attend their hearing? I don't know. What I know is the law is clear. If you are here as a refugee seeking asylum mm -hmm. for a year or more, you can never again go to the court and make sure you have the asylum status. That's it. You have one year inside of the U.S. to fix your situation. What if the courts are backed up like now? Because I read there are 400 asylum judges and they're, they're, they're just backed up. And especially with this recent surge, like the processing is probably falling behind, I can imagine. Well, but that that's not their fault, right? That's okay. They will start their process, right? Within the year, it's just that the court date may not be within a year or sometimes is within a year, but that is continued because okay. of that. But that is not their fault, right? Right, right. Well, What's going on is if you enter and then you wait, maybe you miss your court or maybe mm -hmm. you don't do anything for a year. And then you say, hey, I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to do my, my process, make sure I, I am a refugee illegally. If you pass that year, that's it. You will yeah, be deported. And, and I just really want to make clear to you guys, you know, getting into this whole border situation, I, I'm almost embarrassed as, a, as an American, didn't know really anything about it until recently. Didn't start putting any attention towards it until I went there. And um, what you realize is, or what I thought was if someone, what I was told too a few times was if someone got in seeking asylum, like they're legal to be in the US, but no, you're telling us, no, it's just a window of time. And then right. they can either take a decision to go to that court hearing or disappear into society. Yeah. And, and, and be illegal. Correct. Right. And that's the thing. If you miss your court hearing yeah. from the bench, the judge will issue a deportation order okay. for you. And then if you get caught, if they find you, that's it. You'll be deported. And then as I, I explained yeah. before, when you're deported, you're not going to be able to come back here, even if you have a visa. There is a, something that I'm going to say, because a lot of people don't know that. If you enter here illegally without inspection, uh -huh. and then, you know, and then you live your life, you work, you met a American citizen, and you get married, and you think, wow, now I, I will be able to legalize my status. Right and and right. be able to become a resident and then a citizen. Because if you're married to an American, you're in, or you should be, right? Yeah, well, yes. But a lot of people think that that's the goal. They're gonna find American citizen, marry, and everything's good, and that's not true. If you enter illegally without inspection, without a visa, even if you marry a American citizen, as soon as you start your process, mm -hmm. right, your immigration process, when your petition is approved you will be deported back to your country and you will have if you're in the country for over 180 days illegally you will be sent back to your country with a mandatory ban to enter again for 10 or 20 years that's if you okay marry, Listen, that's if, you, if you marry the american even if you marry american you're gonna be in your back you're gonna have to do a consular process in your own country but as a punishment because you committed a crime right mm -hmm. you're gonna be there for 10 20 years until and then your petition may be approved but look more likely than not you're done once you're out they're not gonna be you know they're not gonna be allow you back and do you think your marriage will survive 10 20 years your wife live in the u.s and you're living outside of the country right all right, I mean, so, that's a reality that nobody really knows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, so okay, as you can see, guys, it's the the deeper you go in. Uh, and Rafa told me, like, what do you want? Like a week to talk about this to get to understand it. And uh, I said, no, yeah. a short synopsis. So that's 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 it's it's so complex, right? What is your, what are your thoughts, Rafa? Like to close this close this up here. And there's no simple solution. There's no uh, you know. 
Magic I, cure, but what do you what do you say? What would be the right way to do it? I <laughs> I, don't, I don't think anyone knows. It's, look, we have good laws in the U.S. We we do have laws, but but the problem is, you know, we have the problem of enforcement of the, those laws. We have the problem of controlling the border. So really, the problem is manpower in courts processing your immigration paperwork mm -hmm. and on the border. And I really don't know if we as a country have appetite for, to spend that kind of money resource to fix that issue. I really don't know. I, I, I don't see a clear solution. I think that's... <laughs> what about the migrants? I was told, um, you know, migrants when they come into the States, well, what I saw firsthand where they were given issued plane tickets, the Catholic charity was funding um, their stay and food and clothes, stuff like that. Now, when they get, they're growing all over the country right now. It's not like they're staying in McAllen, Texas or these border cities, like they're getting mm -hmm. distributed. You can go on the planes, right? You go oh. on the plane from McAllen to Dallas and there are migrants mm -hmm. on there with little pa pamphlets saying they don't speak English and they're given all their documents. What's happening now is also not helping the asylum seekers. It's just for show. Because those people, yeah. the best case scenario, you know, 70% is going to be denied. And, and so those that never saying, show up. You're saying like the what's going on now is not helping the asylum seekers. I mean, it's helping right now, right? I mean, for this, immediately it's helping them because they are not in their country, right? That's helpful. They are here. But long term, I don't think it's going to help them because they're going to have to go through the process. So if they show up in court and they cannot prove their case as a refugee, they're going to be deported and that's it. And, and do you know, per the statistics, only three out of 10 is going to be legit. They're going to be able to prove their case. Right. <laughs> do you know, and all the rest is going to be deported and they're screwed. Then they're never going to be Unless there's a change in the law, like amnesty is granted. That yeah, the unless that's the unless that's the plan that they are saying, look, we're gonna let whatever is the number, a million people get in, mm -hmm. and then as soon as we reach that number, I'm gonna sign the asylum regarding everybody that is here. As long as you don't write, because asylum just sorry, honesty just work if you never committed a crime. Mm. Also, you have that. There are a lot of government resources, federal resources, and I think state resources probably going towards these people that might get sent back, most likely uh -huh. will if they go to court. Yeah. Um, I was told food stamps, but I think that's a federal thing. I think you have to be a U.S. citizen for food stamps. But how, yeah. much, how much do you think is being spent? And you don't have to have a number, but as far as what you saw with the people you, your clients, you were representing. How much was the system paying for their lives here in the U.S.? So that's that's the thing. I, I'm not really sure what's happening right now inside of the system, right? When I was representing uh, immigration clients, right, they they were receiving zero assistance from the U.S. government. There was no assistance. The, the thing was the no, no plane tickets or bus tickets. You are processed and you are let go. And then you just have to attend your court hearing. But at that time, they are not controlling where you go. They don't give you because if you're not a U.S. Uh, citizen, you don't really qualify for any um, government assistance. Like I, I'm, I am an immigrant. I was never an illegal immigrant. But when I was, I am a U.S. citizen now. But when I was a only a U.S. resident, what that means is when you have a green yeah. card. I would never qualify for any government assistance. I, I was I was paying taxes, yeah. but I would not qualify for you know social security or any government grant or anything. So I'm yeah. not sure what's happening now. So I know now they, at least from what I saw from McCallum, they're getting plane tickets, bus tickets, and it was rumored a card with a certain amount of money on it, 800 to 1200, but I can't verify that of uh -huh. money to spend, you know, once getting over because these people yeah. are coming over with like nothing at, by the, for sure. by that point, they've spent oh. so much money to get over. I don't think they're coming with much, um, no. but also 
something, and this could actually turn into a freaking podcast, Rafa, because there's so much to talk <laughs> about, but they're not legal. So if they're here for a year, these, these migrants, and they're not, they're not legal, like until their court hearing and, and that goes through the mm -hmm. system, then how are they making money? You know, they're going to have to work illegally, right? Isn't that the only way yeah. they're going to make money? Yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, if you are here in this limbo status, right, and you don't have a social security, you don't have a work permit or anything, right. you cannot legally work. You can't. You're going to have to work, right, illegally, which is also a crime. And then when you start your immigration process, you're going to be punished by it too. It's going to be a financial fee that U.S. government will apply to you and you have to pay. Well, what do they what do they expect? How are people supposed to live a year without working and making money? Exactly. It, it, that's what I'm saying. The solution is tricky because nobody wants really to resolve that for sure. Why? Because those right. people, and I know because I had a lot of clients, like they are working, sure. they are working illegally, but a lot of people don't talk about that. They are also paying taxes. Yes. Because usually they are using a different name or a fake social security number. They, so the US government, it is collecting taxes and yeah. those taxpayers are not collecting their refund. Right. So then it's a free money for the US government. It's like a now, circle. How, how crazy is that, that the system with social security numbers isn't set up correctly where someone can get a social security number who is not a citizen or not legal here. And then out of their paycheck, money goes towards the federal government and the federal government takes it in. The, the yeah. worker gets none of the you know tax bag or any, you know none of the rebates at the end of the year or anything. Correct. And then everyone just pretends or what, what's going on there? Correct. Everybody pretends and is a free, basically, I know the U.S. is spending a lot of money with the processing and, you know, and, and, and yeah. managing those prisons and the airplanes and all. But also they, I, I think, it's my, just my little observation, but mm -hmm. what the U.S. gain, gain very cheap labor. Yep. And basically gain free tax money that nobody will ever ask for a refund. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and I don't know what are those numbers. That would be a very good area to research and see, well, how much we are really making yeah. with that and how much we are spending, you know? I don't know. All right. You want to close on anything, Rafa? Anything else you want to say here? <laughs> no, I'm just saying that I, I you know, I, I really feel bad for for all those people, you know, that are legitimately coming here and try to improve their lives and, you know, risking their lives. And I really, I don't know what is the solution that we work for everybody. I feel bad for all parties involved. I feel bad for Customs right. and Border Patrol calling themselves babysitters now because they're taking for care sure. of kids and can't do their for job. Sure. I feel bad for the migrants coming from bad situations. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel bad the overall situation that we're like incentivizing criminality, mm -hmm. you know, with, mm -hmm. with bad actors doing, you know, because yeah. customs is so burdened, you know, there's, there's the opportunity now, human traffic, sure. drug traffic, all this stuff. For sure. And, and not a lot of people talk about the ICE agents, right? The, the, the officers there that are risking their lives True, Some of them get killed. But right. it's not easy work out there. Not easy. And uh, don't worry, I'm sure our politicians will fix this in the next couple of years because they do care about all of our best interests. Don't oh, worry, for sure. we're, all, we're all safe. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Rafa, thank you. And oh, oh, in closing here, I want to state to the audience here, Rafa is the the quintessential American dream. He was a, a, a soap, actually it's, it's a little different one. He's a soap opera star, actor in, in Brazil, then had to basically hit the floor cleaning hotel rooms in Reno, Nevada, uh, sure. your first job. And the Mexican cleaners that were with him were uh, starstruck because they couldn't believe their favorite actor was cleaning alongside them. That's true. <laughs> and then he, then he worked up and now he has his own law firm. So it's a beautiful story. And, uh, thank you, my friend. Thank, thank you, you, Rafa, for, for being part of this and uh, explaining a little more behind the scenes. Thank you for being my friend, man. So I just want to mention, guys, you, don't just, you just don't show up in McAllen, Texas and, and get into the scenes with a camera. Uh, I'm only doing so because I'm lucky enough the United Cajun Navy reached out to me. Both Raul and Brian are part of the organization. I want to make a distinction, United, because there are many Cajun navies. This is the United Cajun Navy. 
and you guys basically do disaster relief, hurricanes, tornadoes. Yeah, we're, sort of most people know us as like search and rescues because that's what, that's what they've seen on the news. Right. Uh, flood water rescues, things like that. But we've come, we've become more of a logistical organization. We have warehouses back in Louisiana. People donate a lot of supplies and okay. a lot of uh, a lot of different things. And we just basically we partner with people who have trucks and and they come pick it up and take it out to areas where it's needed. And you know we were reached out to. Um, saying that there were supplies needed here on the border and we weren't really sure what was going on or why it was needed. Okay. We were just told it was a humanitarian crisis so uh, last month uh, I came down myself and hooked up with Raul to see what was going on and you know we see the pictures of the kids sleeping under tinfoil blankets and we have a lot of blankets that were donated by American Airlines for the right. recent freeze over the winter and so we were like okay who can we send supplies to who can distribute it for us. Thanks for bringing me in and and yeah. especially Ro living here and educating me Thank on what's going on in the ground. Thank yeah, you for all you're doing. We need to I'm get this out there let everybody know that, you know what, it is a problem and it is going to affect everybody in the long run. Gotcha. All right. Until the next video.